bank. Describing the behavior of the most sophisticated actors in the space, it was considered to be not worth your time. Do it because you love it. Any computer problem was to wipe and reinstall your stuff. Like I got to dive into the mindset. How beneficial this tool is, how impactful. To get access to all this mind share. That's the creative process, the process of trying. This is Hack Chat. My name is Marco Figueroa. And I think while I've been doing this, I've been lucky enough to have friends. And today I have a special friend on, Runa Sandvik. She focuses on defense, contextual mitigations for at-risk groups, and innovative solutions for journalistic security. Her work builds upon the experience from her time at the Tor Project, Freedom of the Press Foundation, the New York Times, and working closely with freelancers around the world. Runa is also an international sake sommelier. She enjoys to travel. She always posts up on, on Twitter where she is in the world. And if you want to follow her, and I'm sure you probably already do, but if you don't, she is at Runa Sand. Runa, welcome to Hack Chat. Thank you for having me. Oh, I am excited. I'm super happy that you had time. You took time out of your busy schedule. So let's let's go into it. You know, for me, first of all, I love sake with my sushi. So the first question I wanted to ask you was, what made you decide to become an international sake sommelier? Um, so I never had the language in Norwegian or in English to describe texture and flavor. I could tell you um, if I like something or I don't like it, if I was having coffee or wine, I could tell you it tastes like dirt or it does not or it tastes okay. Um, but I really wanted to be able to describe the notes and the flavors and, and what it smelled like and what it looked like. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so my, my husband and I enjoy sake and sushi. And so it was sort of through date nights that we started to just talk about sake. Um, and one day I just figured, why not just learn more about it? So we took a uh, sake advisor course. That's like a four hour course. You get to taste a bunch of sakes. You learn how to describe them, the complexity and the aroma and what it looks like in the class and what it feels like um, in your mouth. And then um, you take like a multiple choice exam at the end. And then from there, if you wanted to, you can do like a two day, like full day, some exam with like a blind tasting and, and everything. Wow. Do you like hot or cold? I like both. Yeah. It's been, it's been fun to explore. I think, I think most people, myself included, um, get introduced to sake through drinking hot sake, mm -hmm. which um, is sort of usually said to be like just the cheapest house sake. You just heat it up and it's like, it's nice, mm -hmm. um, but there's like a ton of other types of sake to explore. Um, I also had an opportunity a couple of years ago to try um, the same type of sake served at room temp, served warm, and then served hot, and just to see how it changes along the way and what kind of notes come out, um, the acidity that you notice when it's hot versus when it's room temp. It's really fascinating stuff. I mean, for me, I love drinking hot sake with like salmon nigiri or just sashimi oh my god I, I don't know it does something like to the salmon for me i just like that's something that i always do i always have those two things anytime i eat sushi i don't go you know reaching for like yellowtail or anything like that i just go give me the salmon give me hot sake that's what i want <laughs> it's a great combo yeah i i mean it is what it actually when we were in new york he was like i'll pick the sake Remember that? That was a nice restaurant yeah. we went to. I, I it's a long time ago. Oh my God. It was <laughs> I think twenty eighteen. But let, let's switch gears. Can you give me details about your background and how you broke into the industry? Uh, let's see. So we do have a um bachelor's degree in um computer science. Mm -hmm. Um and 
the summer before the last year of my bachelor's, this was 2009, I um, got to work for the Tor project as part of Google Summer of Code. Mm. So I worked on a project for Tor for the summer, Google paid me. And then at the end of that um, summer, I just continued to maintain the project that I worked on. I volunteered with the Tor project. Um, I was just really fascinated and, and interested in, in what they were doing. Um, and after, I want to say about nine months, 10 months, um, they offered me a part-time contract that eventually became a full-time contract. And through like four years with the tour project, I really got to explore everything from um, research and development um, from helping a third party provider integrate tour, the tour software into their products to uh, making it easier for people to translate the tour project website, mm. to training reporters, uh, to meeting with law enforcement to understand their side of things. Um, and it was a great opportunity to just connect with people all over the world, to learn a ton of new things and just try a lot of different types of roles. Nice. So I, would, I would say that that is where I started. Have you always been interested like in privacy? And you know, just um, protecting people and at risk people as well? I don't know. So I, it's a really good question. I mean, I got a computer when I was 15 mm -hmm. and um, really at that point, I got to sort of dig into learning how to do things that I'm not supposed to do. And I thought that was really, really fascinating and a really fun challenge. And that's something that I, that I still love. Uh, when I then first read about tour and I found the project, I thought it was really cool that there is a technical way that you can be anonymous online. And that was it. I didn't consider the way that people use the tool. I didn't consider what the tool meant to so many people around the world. And so I do think that it was through my work with the tour project and my exposure to both the developers there the communities that support the tour project and the people that use the program all over the world that that really sort of gave me more insight into just how beneficial this tool is and just how impactful that is and how i through my work with teaching people how to use it and sort of teaching them how to think about the um, risks online really got to see how I can have impact in the world, which for me is something that I'm super, super excited about. Nice. What has changed over the years with the tour project? I would say that the biggest difference um, is how we talk about it. So if you go 10 years back, um, not a whole lot of people talked about tour. It was sort of up and coming at that point. Some mm -hmm. people knew about it, but had heard that it was slow. Some people had tried it and didn't like it, but it was around. Then you've got the uh, the sort of rise of the dark web and mm -hmm. Silk Road and a lot of stories about people, but bad people using Tor to do bad things, really. Um, then Tor's uh, rule during the Arab Spring and how it allowed uh, people in China to circumvent the firewall. And I think today the stories around how people use Tor, we, I, I would argue that we do tend to focus more on the good than the bad. We're not seeing the same type of media stories around um, you know, yet another bad guy using Tor to do something bad. Um, so I think just the narrative has changed around it. It's still around, it has a ton of users around the world, still gets funding, still gets support. And the story that we talk that we tell about Tor is very different. Yeah. I mean, do you still use Tor yourself? Every now and then. Um, yeah. For years, though, Tor was my primary browser, mm -hmm. which um, which has changed now. But I still use it. I advocate for it. I teach people to use it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Hoonix. Um, I love to use it all the time, especially when I'm doing a lot of threat intelligence and, and looking at things. Um, how do you stay anonymous online now 
and and do you have a certain process for me i'm always on hoonix i have it running right now right if i want to do something look at something you know a, a binary that calls out somewhere I, I i'm like run my scripts on there so do you have a process I don't right now, aside from just using the Tor browser, uh, yeah. but um, in the past, I have uh, leveraged a setup that's um, a second laptop that can run Tails. I've done um, air gaps running Tails as well. Um, I've set up, um, primarily use Tails, either Tails mm -hmm. um, as an air gap or as like a custom setup for me or in the combination with Secure Drop or just toward the standalone browser. Nice. What apps do you use for privacy now? Not a whole lot of specific stuff, actually. I use a lot of just standard Signal. browser. Yeah. Or just Signal like secure phone. communication, like do you use Signal and stuff like that? Do you have any opinion? Do you have any opinion what happened with uh, the whole WhatsApp controversy that happened? That they seen a, a big flux of migration of users from WhatsApp to Signal? I am not surprised. I think it was only a matter of time before more people uh, saw that Sig Signal was a um, more privacy preserving app. Mm -hmm. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I saw that you were on the board, uh, a member, board member of, of Signal. How did you get on the board? It's the Signal's network, not Signal the app. Oh, oh, the Signal network. Sorry. Well, I have a question. How do you get on a board? Does someone just reach out to you and just tell you, hey, you know, you want to join the board? I'm not an, on the board of anything. But one day I <laughs> hope to be. So uh, from from my experience with uh, boards in the nonprofit space, mm -hmm. it is, yeah, they, they reach out and, and ask if you're interested in, in being on the board and if you can volunteer your, your time for them. Um, so in the context of the Signals network um, that's run by Delphine, who I've known from my days at the Tor Project and all my work with reporters, um, same with the uh, Norwegian Online News Association, people there that I knew from my work with reporters who um, they were looking for another board member and, and asked if I wanted to, to come on board. Nice. What is What does that role entail? Is it just you're there for advisor to advise them or is, you know you guys meet up once a year? What does that role look like? So it can be it can be anything from um, helping helping the so in the context of the signals network that is providing advice and guidance and support and connections to Delphine and to her org um, to support her in in any way that I can. So whether there are people that that she'd like to get in touch with if she have has questions about security stuff, that's something that I'm available for. For the uh, Norwegian Online News Association, that's a tiny bit different um, in the sense that the board is the org. So we are coming up with like the events that we want to run, the conferences that we do, the challenges that we kick off, and you know, trying to just find creative ways to get people together in like 2020 uh, has been an interesting challenge. Um, but those are like board seeds in in both cases, but different nice what was it like um when you worked at the new york times in the newsroom was it like the tv where everyone's running around and there's a big story and and was it like that uh no and i sort of thought it would be it was uh it was very quiet and um, and i remember one day like so the the new york times headquarters is near times square in new york city mm -hmm. And I uh, forget what what year it was, but at some point, someone had uh, decided to, to drive a car through Times Square and, and hit people. And I found out not because there was commotion in the newsroom and people running around, but because friends in Norway pinged me on Facebook and asked if I was okay. 
So it was just like very, very quiet, like heads down, people, people focus. Um, you have, you know, people doing calls and interviews and, and, you know, walking between meetings, but there's not the commotion that you, that you see on TV. Yeah. I remember, I think it was 2017. I don't know. We, we, I went over there and you took me on a tour, but it was a Friday, right? And it was afternoon and it was empty, but it was it was an amazing tour and I greatly appreciate you doing that. But it was very quiet. I was like I was I was a little scratch in my head, but then I mean, if anyone has ever watched uh The West Wing, there's this episode that they say, you know, they throw out all the good news on Friday because no one reads the news on Friday. So I was just it, it clicked in my head, you know, everybody on Friday is already you know, out the door and enjoying their weekend and, you know, no big news stories going to come out there. But but it was a great tour. What was the first big change that you implemented with privacy at The New York Times to protect journalists? I would say, um, I mean, one thing that that we focused a lot on initially was, um, identifying the current needs and the gaps in the newsroom um, mm -hmm. and then rolling out a lot of training and sort of education and awareness efforts. I think the biggest thing that we did was towards the end of 2016, we launched the New York Times tips line. So up until that point, um, if a source wanted to securely send something to a reporter at the New York Times, they had to have an established relationship with that person to be able to send them something on signal or encrypted email or even just send them a regular email like you had to know someone and know how to securely send them something to actually get in touch with them um, there was no way for a source to just contact the new york times newsroom mm -hmm. so uh in late 2016 um through a collaboration with people um, in the newsroom, in the tech department, and also in legal, uh, we then launched the uh, the page on nytimes.com slash tips, uh, which then lists, um, and I think it still is, uh, Signal, WhatsApp, Secure Drop, Postal Mail, Encrypted Mail. I think, I think those are the options. And really then provided a um, process and a workflow and a set of tools for the newsroom to receive information from the public in a way where um, the source can choose to identify themselves or not, uh, but still then submit in information that is relevant and of interest to to the uh, newsroom. Wow, that's amazing. And then I know, I think it was, I don't recall, I don't know if you were there yet, they, um, that a APT had had attacked um, the New York Times. Was that before you joined or after? I remember. It was before, before. yeah. China went after um, New York Times yeah. reporters Did in 20, I think it was 2012. It was shortly after the New York Times published a story about uh, rich people in, in China. Yeah. Did you see... I mean, from 2012 to when you got there, was there, were they investing in, in security like that? Bringing in products, you know, trying to upgrade all of security because when, when people start poking at you and ABT start, you know, penetrating your networks, you know, and, and this is from experience, you know, that you're a target, they're going to come back. They want in. Right. And one of the things you know, in the organization I used to work at, they they figured it out and they were starting like every year we were getting double the money to bring in, you know, products. We didn't have any visibility. And then we decided, OK, here's this money. You're going to see endpoints. Here's this money. We need a data lake, you know, and that for me was was awesome because it got to let me see the endpoints and and start writing some good yar rules so we can catch stuff and and we did but that would have never happened if they didn't decide to make that investment did did you see that along your time at, at the new york times where there was an investment in security to upgrade the security yeah i mean i think that the trend that you're 
describing is something that applies to the industry as a whole, like whether we're talking media or healthcare mm-hmm. or finance or any other type of sector. Um, unfortunately, but commonly, something has to happen right before. Yeah. Oh, People that's top that's this is worth investing in. I I completely agree with that because one of the things when I was in in this place where I was working last organization, it's a cost, right? Security, IT, it's a cost. It's not like pure business. You're not sharing, yeah. you're not generating any income. So it is it is in the red all the time. So this is why a lot of people because an incident doesn't happen you don't see that invest investment initially now with this ransomware coming out and you seeing hospitals and you seeing all of these, you know, places getting hit, they're starting to invest and, and, and the cost of, of putting those things in place outweigh exactly downtime for, for, um, just downtime for the business that they could lose a lot of money. So I, I, I definitely, I'm definitely seeing that as well. It also becomes this like uh, discussion around what the company is legally op- obligated to do mm. versus what is the what is just the right thing to do for people, for your staff, for your customers, and for the public. And those two things are not necessarily always aligned. Do you think uh, this is all opinion? Do you think um, companies should be obligated to report? on, you know, things, they get hacked or something like that. Because I know, you know, this goes into our next question. But for me, I I always say you have to be transparent, you have to be honest, especially when it affects not only your company, but other companies out there. You know, do you think they should like they were talking about maybe putting in some sort of law to to make sure that people go ahead and and share what's going on in in their organization i think my my understanding of that latest proposal is that it would only be required of the um of the companies that provide a certain service to the u.s government so Mm. not necessarily everyone but do i think that people should be more transparent and share when something happens absolutely i think the uh, narrative, even even around um, ransomware attacks in Norway, which happens quite often now, um, people don't really talk about it. And in Norway, as far as I'm aware, there isn't the equivalent of like the Verizon data breach report. Mm. Like you can't really see stats. You don't see uh, any stats around actual attacks or attempts. So when it does happen to you, you think shit. We, we really messed up like it is it is just us we cannot tell anyone it's really embarrassing and so i think that whether you make it a illegal obligation to report or not i think there's a huge benefit in sharing and being transparent and changing just how we talk about being affected by um a cyber attack yeah this goes into the next question because some of your tweets are gold and this is why i said in the beginning if you're not following runa on twitter you need to and make sure you hit the notification because every tweet i want to read at any time she tweets i read it i get that notification because uh, something like this i and i quote this is a tweet i i think it was recently you said saying 1000 engineers worked on an attack is like saying 1000 journalists worked on today's front page story details like org structure roles responsibilities matter how do you think runa companies working on solar winds have handled sharing details because i love that tweet because it was so <laughs> on point i I tweeted something along those lines, like shortly after FireEye went public in, I think it was like around December 8th mm-hmm. last year, right? At that point, we didn't yet know about solar winds, but we knew that someone had attacked FireEye, someone mm-hmm. had uh, gotten away with their red team tools, and mm-hmm. there was FireEye, a security firm, going out and saying, hey, we got hacked, they took this stuff, we're still investigating, but here's what we want you to know. And um, I said, like, shortly after that, that 
um, as, as we started to learn about solar winds and Microsoft and all the other firms now either potentially affected or affected that FireEye is going to be remembered as the company that notified people and that spoke out, not the company that got hacked mm -hmm. in this case. Um, and I think that is a fantastic op opportunity. Um, and I also just think that it's, I think there is no shame in, mm -hmm. in being the victim of an attack, period. Like whether yeah. we're talking a physical in-person attack or it is a cyber attack, I think there are a whole lot of uh, challenges, especially in the space and the work that we do with budget and resources and information. And something's going to happen at some point. I think and there's, I think there's so much to uncover with what you just said, right? There is no shame. I think a lot of people do not, aren't transparent because it's it, stock prices, you know, because when FireEye got hit, their stock dropped, right? And one thing about what I it's back up. yeah, it's it is back up and it's way above where it once was. So for me, it is I, I thought what you said was was spot on and what they did was be transparent. This is what's going on, right? What I find especially what what happened is I don't see the transparency a, a, across the board, right? So we uncovered a sample, right? Why aren't you sharing it? Why is it not, not on virus total? It's not like it has all day on it, right? I can understand if you don't want to share it because all there is is techniques, right? We don't, we don't have a clear picture. SolarWinds provided a timeline. To me, that timeline, it's, I understand that's the visibility you have, but if you look at it, there's zero way as a red teamer, a reverse engineer, there's no way that I penetrate a network. I know exactly where everything is. And in eight days, you know, write specific software for your build, for your, the way you build your software and yeah. put test code in it in eight days. It's, are you kidding me? Like, you know, I wish. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's, there's zero chance. It's that definitely they were penetrated way before and they understand, they understood how everything looked and set up. And that is important to, to, you know, share not only the samples, because guess what? I might have, you know, data that that sample, if I wrote a yard rule and I run it against my data, I might get hits. Right. There's also with um, the Microsoft report, they haven't uh, shared the Cybot, right? That one interests me. So this is why for me, I'm like, we have to share. We can't just say this is this is what happened. Here's the report and then do not share hashes or don't go further into detail. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things that I constantly say. We need to be more transparent, especially with this one. There were so many people, you know, that was affected by this. You can't just sweep yeah. this under the rug and say it's the final report that we're going to talk about it. Right. And then you uh, I know in the congressional hearings, Amazon didn't even participate. So, yeah. I mean, and what, is, what is fascinating is if you look at the timeline for what happened, mm -hmm. you have. Um, potential traffic from a victim around April mm -hmm. last year. Then last summer, you have a security firm assisting a client with suspicious stuff going on with their SolarWinds box. Mm -hmm. um, they're unable to figure out exactly what's going on, but they do notify SolarWinds, but ultimately they just chalk it up to an isolated incident. Fast forward to September, October, Palo Alto sees a similar issue within their own network they try to investigate, they know my solar wins. I think ultimately they too just chalk it up to an isolated incident. What if FireEye had also just chalked it up to an isolated incident? What if these companies had shared information publicly prior? Things could have been very different. Yes. And the way I think of this as well is as the adversary, if I go after FireEye, I'm, I'm already playing with the house's money, but if I go after FireEye, the likelihood of me getting caught 
is very high or any security company. It's very, very high. So they were like, I'm playing with the house's money. We got all the jewels. We got everything we wanted. I want those red team tools. Like, those, it's to like me, when you when you've already achieved the thing that you set out to achieve, and now you get to have fun and see how how long until you're caught, then yeah, you take some risks. Yeah, I mean, t- that was a big risk, and it blew up their op- ops, right? So it was like, who cares? Like they they have all the tools. Their FireEye's red team tools. I'm I'm wondering, like, what is? I mean. It, it blew my mind when I was like, man, if you think of it, they were playing with house's money. They were like, we're going to do this anyway. And one of the things I would like to know was because I don't know the timeline of when they first discovered something, when that, uh, that the alert phone? happened with the phone. It Did they give it before Thanksgiving? Okay. So, so I, there's a in a, um, I'll, I'll I'll send you the stuff that I have. Like yeah. uh, they uh, they said that uh, just after Thanksgiving they reached out to my, Microsoft for assistance. So it was around that timeline. Okay, okay. Just because I I know at least for me I was I was listening to when uh, Mandy Ant was um, briefing Congress and they were like we had. 50 people reversing everything. And I was just like, man, that's, a, I mean, they knew something big was going down. So it is yeah. for me, it is like, it changed the game, but I don't think this is like the last, not even of this group, but of supply chain attacks. This is like, it's, it happened before, right? So yeah. this is, it's, it's nothing new, especially with CC cleaner. You know, I was I was on on that case when when CC Cleaner came out, and you know, and this is why this is so. Here's an example why it's important to share. I'm gonna break it down. I was at an organization. We were named in this report, and we were blindsided. So they published. It was Talos. They published the report. They're like, okay. You know, we reached out to them. Let's have a conference call before the conference call. We're going to share out the binary to you. Great. Thank you. Cause it wasn't on virus total. I get the binary I'm doing reverse engineering and there was a, um, a function that said, okay, if you have, um, windows seven and a book, it was windows seven. I believe it was, it was 2016. I think it's either windows seven. Yeah. Windows seven and above you go down this route, right? If you have anything from windows XP and below or windows, um, server, uh, I think it was 2003 and below you go down this route, right? Well, this side didn't affect us, but guess what? This side did because we had systems that did have those windows XP running and they didn't report on it. And it was important to us. I reported on it. I was like, okay, now you got to look for this, 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 and this. And that's one thing. That's one thing. When we had the call, I mentioned it to them. I said, thank you for sharing, but you guys didn't cover this and this affected us. And that's what I'm saying. Why it's so important to go ahead and share share as much as you can. I understand if, you know, there's contracts at NDA that you can't share. If you, you know, someone is someone, you know, there's a binary you picked up, you can't share it. I get that. But when it's something this big and you're working like on solo wins and, and you pull a binary that is associated with this attack, you have an army of people wanting to look at that, wanting to find pieces that they might miss. What I usually do is when a report comes out, I look at their report and I reverse the binary and go with and just look at what they have and what the binary says just to confirm, like, did they miss something? Yeah. And I always look at that. And then usually what I do is I write my own yard rules. I don't even you know, use their yard rules. So it's uh, for me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's also how you learn, right? Yeah. 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 
Absolutely. Uh, learn and, and figure out, okay, the next time they put a report out, depending on who's putting it out, you know, do I want to go? Did, did they find, you know, something? And I, I've always loved to do that, like check their work. And I don't put out any blogs or anything. I, I reach out and say, hey, you guys might have missed this. Here's additional binaries associated to this campaign. Right. I try to contribute regardless who it is that happened uh, in 2015, I believe, with Silence. Uh, they wrote a report on WinNTI. And basically, I was just uh, doing some threat intelligence, did some pivoting, found more more uh, binaries associated to it. They didn't list like the certificate. I was like, you got to list the certificate. And if you look up the certificate, there's more binaries there. And now you have a whole little uh, cluster there. So I digress. I mean, I went on a little rant, I, but that's why. I think it's a great point. I mean, I completely agree. And it's and it's also, um, it what, what you were describing, it, it makes me think about just how we talk about the need for diversity in InfoSec. Just more people with a seat at the table with more backgrounds yeah. different experience, different access to information who can just like put a lot of things into context. Yeah. And I love having conversations about like what your way of doing things are, right? Like, oh, it's great. you know, yeah. I, I, I love that because I get to learn all the time, right? Like uh, how do you bypass uh, VBA macros, right? It's like you have your technique. I have my technique of doing it. And like, how can I get a better technique? I go into, you know, hex editor and modify the key so I could bypass the, the password that, you know, someone put on their macros. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good always to share and do stuff. But next question I have for you. Have you done any more cool stuff with guns lately? And for the people that don't know, give a little background. Sure. Uh, back in 2015, my husband and I uh, hacked a Wi-Fi powered sniper rifle and presented at uh, Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, we we showed that you can uh, like we were able to take apart the the mobile apps. We found a way to lock the trigger. We found a way to create our own custom software update. So supply chain attack right there. Um, and we found we found a way to also modify the software in such a way that you would miss your target. You would shoot like two and a half feet to the left or to the right of your of your intended target. Um, have we done more? No, uh, I have found other other fun things that I would love to be able to do. Like there are now like cat toilets that you can connect to the internet, but um, I have I have not gotten as far as actually working on it. Really nice. I wanted to talk to you about um, your new post um, advising the Norwegian government. Um, can you go yeah. into that? It, it seemed interesting. Yeah, so as of as of uh, March 1st until um, at least end of July of this year, I am advising the Norwegian Armed Forces Cyber Defense um, and advising the leadership group there on anything, everything cyber. So they really wanted someone who's got a different kind of background, who can think a bit out of the box, who can just ask questions for things that maybe they've thought about and they've sorted out, which great, I learned something new and they get to confirm that like, yes, they they, they have this sorted. Uh, or in some cases, we can just brainstorm things that like should be improved. We can talk about, you know, what are we seeing that um, the, like what is happening with the debate around all things cyber in the US, in the UK, within NATO, is there anything there that we should learn or the people that we should connect with? Um, what should we think about moving, moving forward? Nice. You've been doing uh, threat intelligence for a while. What for someone new coming into the game, what would you recommend for them? Uh, 
I would say figure out which part of it you'd like. Like, what is it that has you interested in threat intel? For some people, it's all about knowing the infrastructure and they're all about understanding domains and pivoting within that space and the infrastructure leverage in different types of attacks. For some people, it is um, reversing or more specifically understanding ransomware and reversing ransomware. Uh, for some people, it's more about geopolitics and understanding the intention and the motivation and how states can and cannot respond. Um, there are like so many different places that, mm -hmm. that you can go. Um, which is which is something that I that I love about this space is that like I I never run out of things to learn or things to do or things to look at, but I would say like there is not any one any one path within this space. So look around and sort of see what you're in interested in, and then find people who work on that thing and connect, ask them questions. I in the past like two months, I have reached out to like at least 10 people that I have never talked to outside of Twitter and just said, hey, you know, could we do a virtual coffee for 30 minutes? I would love to pick your brain on topic X, Y, Z. And they're like, yeah, I'm sure. No problem. People will happily do that with you in this space if you just ask. And I think that that is a really good lesson. That is awesome. I, I, I think I'm going to do that myself. Um, for me, I, I loved everything you said, and, and I'm that type of person, like you said, when, when it comes to reversing, I always try to find like clues there which lead me into something else, which then I could pivot off of and, and, and continue to try to look for different clusters. There is so much to learn always. And, and, and yeah. I feel that, like, that's why I love like reading your tweets. You come out with these books that um, we need to read, right? I, I think, I, I forget the name of the book. It's like a upside down question mark or a hook. Um, Only cats. Yes. Yes. Can you go, can you go into that? Cause you were saying it was an interesting read. I haven't gotten to it and I want to get into it. Sure. So, um, Bellingcat is a, um, I would describe it as an investigative, nonprofit newsroom of sorts. Like they have done some fantastic research over the years, um, figuring out, um, you know, uh, different uh, Russian agents behind various types of, of poisoning attacks, figuring out um, who most likely shot down the Malaysian Airlines flight over Ukraine. Uh, figuring out um, who poisoned Navalny, like they do some amazing, amazing deep research using mostly publicly available data. They're just really good at digging and sort of just finding clues all over the place and just piecing it all together. Um, and so they recently published a book um, about just how it all started, how how this one guy at home in the UK um, enjoyed digging and finding, to your point, just like you mentioned earlier, with like reading a report and reversing the binary and then sharing what you found if you think that they missed something. He was doing that, but within open sources and sharing it on, I think it was the Guardian website mm. in the comments section just sharing, here's other things that I found that you might have missed. Here's this important context. And he, the way that he talks about the, like just the bug, the curiosity that you feel when you're like, when you think you found something and you mm -hmm. just start pulling on that thread, right? And you find something new and you find something new and it leads to something bigger. And suddenly you have something that no one else has found. Mm -hmm. And he really describes going from being one person in his home in the UK doing that and being just totally like hooked to building a community, connecting with people in other countries around the world, um, creating effectively now belling hats and setting a standard for what open source investigations look like. Like what are the challenges? What kind of tools do you need? What are the ethics? How do you make that a financially viable business. Um, and it's not like it gotten to the point where media orgs like the New York Times have open source investigative 
teams within their newsrooms because they see that this methodology and this approach works really, really mm. well within a newsroom. So mm. it's it's a it's a really, really fascinating read. And they have training, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they do. They provide training. Yeah, it's so they do offer uh, workshops. Um, I think some of them are like five day, like intense workshops. But if you email them and ask nicely, they they will also put together a private training for you. Ooh, that is nice. Yeah. It, I, is, I, it is fantastic. I it's definitely great. want to take their training because I always find you always can learn more, especially like you said, when you start pivoting, it's it's important. Let me ask you, when do you think I have enough to go with it because there's one thing that I have is like I try to peel back so many layers and then I'm like, maybe I missed something. I go back and then run it through and I'm like, maybe. All right. I might find one other thing and then I start second guessing. What else did I miss? If I if I didn't miss that, when is it go time for you? When is it like, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I do like about my boss, he's like, Get, here's a hard date. This is this it got to go out by this date. Yeah. And and it's it's like I feel like sometimes a reporter because he's like, you give me a date and I'm sticking. You have to stick to it. Right. And I have yeah. a report coming out next week, which which is going to be interesting. But, you know, Can't wait to read it. Yeah. When wh when is it? When do you feel like it's <laughs> it's go time? It's it has the stamp. Something is completed, <laughs> completed. Like, OK, yes. I could I could lay this to rest i think it just comes down to this 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 question of like with what do you have right now have you answered the question that you set out to answer originally have you achieved the thing that you wanted to achieve originally you can you can always continue to refine it and edit it and you can hunt some more and you can pull in some more data but at some point you're either too far in the weeds or you sort of shifted from your original goal and it's mm. never going to be perfect. It's never going to be complete at some point. Just just put it out and maybe someone will help you along the way. Uh, maybe that's where it ends. Maybe it leads to something new and something bigger. If you're just sitting on what you have forever, then you're missing out on a lot of good work as well. Runa, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. And I can't wait Thank until you. I go to New York City so yes. we can go out, hang out again. You know, I know both of us will be co-vaxxed and yes. I'm, I'm excited to see you. I, I don't maybe I'll be there later this year, maybe. But Fingers when I do crossed. touch down New Sushi York City. Oh, yes. When I do touch down in New York City, I'll make sure to reach out. Thank you so much for coming on hack chat and any last words for anyone this has been great like awesome it's been it's been fantastic it's been great seeing you again too and i can't wait to catch up in person absolutely thank you until next time have a good one